And I think we are going to start on time and end on time. So thank you so much for joining us this afternoon um, for presidential reflections, what the Developmental Education Initiative taught us about scaling up. So today, um, we have a great panel of college presidents that have been with us along our DEI journey. And I'm just going to give you a, a quick introduction to them and to the initiative. And then we'll, um, we'll turn into the, the meat of our agenda today, which is to hear from, from these folks um, about their leadership um, on their campuses. So today we have uh, Laura Meeks from Eastern Gateway Community College, Anita Glinitsky from Housatonic Community College, and Randy Parker from Guilford Technical Community College. Um, and they'll, be, they'll tell you a little bit more about their institutions in just a moment. The Developmental Education Initiative was um, a three-year program um, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Lumina Foundations that involved 15 Achieving the Dream community colleges and six Achieving the Dream states that were early participants in the ATD initiative. And they were invited to participate um, because they had proven success with some small developmental ed programs on their campuses, had shown um, some promising results with those, and we wanted to find out what policies, practices, and resources it took to scale those up to more students. Um, some of the things that have grown out of that initiative, uh, we have seen some really great work on all 15 campuses, some phenomenal work at the state level, um, aligning policies um, from financial aid to performance funding um, and assessment and placement to support um, effective developmental education. And um, also um, developed our own sort of practice and model for how scaling works. Um, you may have seen the um, MDC's uh, guidebook, um, More to Most, and I just realized I didn't tell you Agua. Now that I've mentioned MDC, I'm Abby Parcell from MDC, which is one of the founding partners of Achieving the Dream and also managing partner of DEI. Um, so we have also just recently released um, a new publication called What We Know, Lessons from the Developmental Education Initiative. You may have seen it um, on um, a table near the registration desk. It's also available for download on the MDC website. We've got the, the web address there. Um, and this is a two-part publication. One is um, a summary and synthesis of some work that our DEI college teams did looking at the ideal pathway for students um, who arrive on campus underprepared for college level work um, that they built together based on their experience in DEI. And the second is a series of reflections from all 15 DEI college presidents. Um, each of them uh, wrote an essay talking about the unique leadership challenges of what it meant to take on uh, the challenge of developmental education at a time when there were um, leadership transitions, reductions in financial resources, um, major sort of institutional restructuring and, and changes. And that's what we're going to focus on today. So um, I'm going to start by turning it over to President Meeks. Um, and each of our presidents is going to give you a brief description of what DEI looked like on their campus, um, what their policy or programmatic targets were for the initiative, and um, and go from and we'll start there. Good afternoon. Uh, Jefferson Community College uh, was a college of 2,100 students, and we were. Um, uh, achieving the Dream College in the second round in 2005, and then we were selected, invited by uh, DEI to be one of the 15 colleges in the nation to um, to really help our students navigate and succeed in developmental education. Today, um, our name has changed. Uh, we're now Eastern Gateway Community College, and instead of having one county of service, we now have three service counties, 
And we've grown over those years since we first started being the Achieving the Dream College to now we're 3,700 students. Our minority population in 2005, when we began this, this um, important step, was 1.8 minority, and the, uh, our minority um, population is primarily African American. Today, our minority population is 15%. And um, so I guess what you heard from me right now is that this college, Eastern Gateway Community College, has taken on a challenge of becoming, our goal is to become one of the best uh, colleges in terms of the production of uh, success of students in developmental education. And at the same time, we, had, we were given an opportunity to completely expand our service area, and now we serve some of the poorest cities in the nation in addition to the cities that we've already served. So what I want to say is, I just am very grateful for, for the opportunity to have learned since 2005 how to better serve our students. And it's quite an opportunity when you talk about scaling. Not only did we scale everything I'm telling you about at the original college, Jefferson Community College, with 2,100 students, but we're scaling this opportunity today in three additional counties, now with 3,700 students. We're the fastest growing community college in Ohio, the fastest growing college in Ohio, as well as we're in the top 50 in the nation in terms of growth. The greatest success that I can tell you about is what's happening in Ohio right now. And let me tell you as a president, I am very grateful that we've been focusing on the success of our students, particularly in developmental education. In Ohio, we used to have 10% of our funding came from student success. 90% came from access, and you know what I'm talking about, enrollment driven. Today, starting next year, it's going to be 50% funding for enrollment and 50% for student success. And when I found, when I heard about that, I'm going, oh goodness, we'd be better off if we could do it on access because we're so fast growing. But when I saw the printout of how well our college did, if you, on the success factors, 25% is coming from course completion, and 25% is coming from six other facts, seven factors put together, four of which are developmental education outcomes. Are you following me or am I talking too fast? In other words, four of those success factors in the 25% um, funding are because how well we're doing in developmental education. So when I saw how we did in those three, in those three areas, growth, student success, and course completion, we did best on course completion, second best on student success, and third on access. So I want to say, hurrah, we were saved. Because our college, compared to others, is, do, is above, is doing very well in all three of those areas. We, these are some of the things that we have done, not just for developmental students, but for all students on, our, on all of our campuses. We have mandatory orientation, a mandatory orientation before you can enroll. Those are two separate orientations. We have developmental education placement required in your first semester. So if you need developmental math, you, are, you must take your, your developmental math course at that time. We have, student, we have support services for all of our students, uh, no, not all, for developmental students and for uh, some of our trio students. We have coaches, we have tutors for all students, and we have a data research consultant for our developmental education program to help us really be sure of our data. We also have a, um, a, a get ready, get set, go program to help students uh, kind of brush up on their skills before, before and after they take the compass test so they can uh, hopefully do better. We also have professional development on our campus for developmental educators, including um, a wonderful program led by Rosa Sarah from the Carnegie, Carnegie Foundation. She talks about faculty inquiry groups. And these groups, if I get a chance to talk, talk to you about it more, have been very instrumental in helping our faculty form community of learners. We were also uh, assisted by Karen Wheeler of the Arkansas Department of Education, who taught us about the Carol Twig model for course redesign. And we have now redesigned all of our math and English developmental courses, and we are completely using a math emporium model for all of our students. So we have scaled all of our students in every section, in every site, are all using the math emporium model and course redesign um, from based on Carol Twig. 
We've also had extensive training and courses such as Bridges Out of Poverty for administrators and faculty. And we've learned about turning technology, a clicker program that we're using in many of our courses and, and some of our developmental courses. In addition, we've provided many professional development days for faculty. We've hired three new full-time developmental teachers that we've never had any in 2005. Our ABLE uh, cutoff scores of the students' scores now at a lower level uh, from ABLE, but we refer them to ABLE rather than to developmental education. And I'd like to tell you a little bit more about our course redesign. That's our major focus in DEI, and we're very, very pleased. We have um, the Blackboard platform will be in 10 um, next semester, and we pair that, we partner that up with Pearson products, My Math Lab, and My Writing Lab, and we have a lot of tutorials, and it's working very well. <coughs> we put reading and English together, and we did have one experiment that we had 100% pass rate and um, no attendance problems. We combined a developmental uh, class in English using the Carroll Twig model with uh, cooperative learning. I thought, I thought it would help if I paid students to succeed, so I donated $500 to this class. So I was hoping that maybe money would matter, but we found out from the students that getting a little money for doing better didn't work. I was kind of glad because I didn't have to pay any more after that. <laughs> but um, it was just an experiment. But what really made the success was cooperative learning. And we have some uh, faculty and deans who are experts in that that can help us. I would like to tell you, you've received from me a printout that if you look, you know, count eight down, you'll see the green. The, the green uh, factors are the ones the president is evaluated upon. So at our college every month, the Board of Trustees receives this scorecard they help develop it. It's based on our strategic plan. But you will see that the president of Eastern Gateway Community College, I am evaluated on student outcomes. I want to be held accountable for how well our students do. And I'm willing to put my job, just like a football coach does, on the line for that outcome. You'll see that um, some of our outcomes, uh, most of our outcomes are positive. Uh, we're up in completion rates in everything except um, one class in uh, Developmental English 99. Our pass rate went down one semester. But we don't panic about that because we are just, we're in it for the long run. Our Developmental Ed fall pass rates, you won't see on that sheet, you'll see all the other ones. On the very top, um, do you see the very top of the form where it says to become a, a leader in developmental education? That shows our developmental outcomes. Fall 2011, we had a C or better pass rate in our, in our developmental ed classes of 56%, and fall 2012, 58%. I, I don't want to um, rush, but I'm running out of time, but I do want to tell you also, in addition to the scorecards, that we use no Levitz and CESA student evaluations every other year. So we do no Levitz and CESA, and we use them. We listen to what the students have to say. We post thermometers in the hallway talking about how many we hope come back for spring semester and we keep a thermometer like they do for United Way. <laughs> but the best thing I can tell you and my final comment on how well we're doing, you can see in the scorecard, listen, I'm not proud of some of those results. You're gonna read them and say, what is it, 25% of your students graduate? You know, I know that should be higher. But you know what, I'm proud of our college that we're, we're, we are willing to show our stuff and we're making improvements in most of our categories. But I want to tell you what I'm most proud of. On the Noel Levitz employee survey that we do annually, again, it's the employee survey. When we've surveyed our, fac our faculty, staff, and administrators, the number one before we start achieving the dream and DEI, the most important value, and the thing that most people would like to improve on our campus was morale. On the last, the last four years when we've used this survey, the number one indicator, the things that what means the most to the faculty, staff, and administrator, and what they hope we can improve the most is retention. So when you can change a college climate from having morale be the most, most important goal of our college to that of retention, you know that you've made a difference. And I just wanted to tell you that I'm very grateful for the hard work that we've all done together at our college. All right, thank you. Thank you. What's been fascinating as we work together as DEI colleges 
are the uh, areas that are very, very comparable and the areas that are very different. Uh, Housatonga Community College is in Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is the largest city in the state. It's also the poorest city. Uh, my college is a uh, majority minority. And all the students who come to our college, the majority will test into developmental courses, needing at least one. And the majority of them will also be eligible for federal financial aid. Uh, this is in the same county as you've read about the 1%. Uh, many of the 1% live at the other end of the county in Fairfield County, uh, Connecticut. So we're the living embodiment of the disparity between those who have and have not in terms of their educational opportunity. We too began as an Achieving the Dream College in 2004. And what the data showed then, which was a surprise, but now it's become a national norm, as we looked at our data, the students that were entering our college were scoring lower and lower. We used Accuplacer in Connecticut. So the scores were going down, particularly in math. And much to the horror of the faculty, the uh, pass rate, which is defined as C or above, was also doing an absolute downward slide. And the reason for the tremendous shock of that is this is a college that has had and still has a very strong developmental education department with faculty committed, uh, student services committed to student success. Once that data became available, what was looked at is the second question, okay, uh, not as many are passing, but what happens to them once they pass the course of the developmental education sequence? In English, students who began with developmental education would pass the college level English course at 20, 10 to 20% higher than those who tested directly into the course. The absolute converse was true in math. Those who came through developmental math courses then went on to the college level math course. It was 20 to 30 percent le less likely to succeed in the course with a grade of C or above than those who tested directly into it. So need I say, once this data was looked at, checked, rechecked for accuracy, the number one focus that we began with it with in achieving the dream and then continued with developmental education was that focus on math. And our students did help us. The initial focus groups, well, what's going on? We think we're providing great courses. You know, why are we not passing our uh, developmental ed courses? And the student who was uh, most helpful said, well, you teach them too fast and too slow. He said, that doesn't make sense. How can we be doing that? But when he explained it, it makes perfect sense. No one comes to us with zero knowledge, particularly in math, they come with gaps. I and mean, we've seen the literature on this you know, in the subsequent years. And so therefore, obviously, that which the student knows, it's boring, it's dull, the test had to be wrong, they shouldn't be in this developmental, uh, developmental math course. That which they don't know, because it's this perfect 15 week moving along course, it goes too fast, they don't learn it the second time. If they average out you know, all those tests in 15 weeks so that they pass, they go on to the next level of math course with those same gaps. Maybe improve somewhat, but still not filled in. So as with many of you who have been working on this, we developed what we call open exit, open entry, uh, now called it self-paced, but it's that accelerating program. The student zips past that which he or she knows, spends their time, it's mastery of all concepts in order to complete the course. And that has been very successful for us. We stopped the downward slide, we're on the upward slope in terms of students completing and continuing their math courses. We've been able to embed this again uh, when we uh, went into DEI. So it's now a normal part of our schedule in that when you look at our schedule, there's all the accelerated Southeast courses on it. Remember one of the pieces I said, the developmental ed courses did, in math in particular did not truly prepare the students for the college level math courses. 
So a major piece that was done under DEI was for the faculty to get together, college level math faculty and the developmental math, and they had already been working all together. They really tore the courses apart and then they redid both the developmental and the college level. They did that curriculum realignment. And the beauty of this is that it not only helped the faculty understand the needs of each other, what it did because it required curriculum change, so we had to go through the curriculum committee, college senate, and again showed the work of two areas to again help students with their success. As we again continue to talk with students, ask students what does, does not help you, we receive that persistent statement also, I should have done better on my active placer. And again, we stress to students, prep for this test. Don't walk in cold. It's a high stakes exam. But we took them very seriously and said, well, maybe you need a little more than that which we have online. So we developed a three week intensive online test preparation, first in math, and we've subsequently added that for English. And so what students would do is take the active placer, be invited to take this three week intensive program, and then retest. We would have students going from uh, what we call math 075, add, subtract, divide uh, decimals, and then they would test into pre-calc after they finish this three week intensive program. But the most critical piece is, okay, what happened to them? Do we just teach them what the test would have? Uh, we follow them in their higher level course, whether it was pre-calc, algebra, whatever that next level was. And we found we had an over 80% pass rate by these students. So we know that this preparation did help them. And we began it with by invitation only. Now it's encouraged for all students to do this. Do they all take advantage of it? No, they don't but it is there and it's uh, available to them. Faculty teaching math courses where they find a student stumbling on a particular concept, they will send them into that same lab with the same facilitator saying, you know, with a note or telling them verbally, I need to, re uh, to review this module. And so they will use that lab for those quick, I need this refresher right here, I've got a gap in my knowledge. So we've been able to keep that uh, going and viable. Uh, the question that we were asked to answer, not only what were we doing as part of our DEI initiative, but what are we most proud of? And for me, what I'm most proud of is the fact that the faculty and staff took absolute ownership of this problem of students not succeeding. They worked incredibly well together. And when we still weren't getting the results we wanted, you know, these phenomenal passing rates in developmental math, they again stepped back, talked with students, and of course we've done then, based upon that, the professional development on how to help students with those affective behaviors. You know, we do the orientation, but it's not enough. We need to keep reinforcing that and have faculty be able to work with students uh, with their diverse learning styles, etc., And there's many vendors out there, but we found that the on-course program was the most helpful to all of us. And as I look with the faculty, the state of Connecticut is changing all the rules on developmental ed. But as I watch the faculty, as they're managing with this with much unknown, they're continuing to be the leaders in the state in trying to uh, respond to this legislative change. They are looking at that which we have done, recombining, reconfiguring, using the curriculum committee. So in other words, their focus is on, okay, they're changing the rules on us at the state level, but how can we develop that which will be the best for our students? And to have faculty and staff that involved and that continue to be focused on student success to me is our greatest success as a result of being a DEI college. Thank you.
little bit about Guilford Tech. Guilford Tech is located in an urban area in Greensboro, North Carolina. We serve about 45,000 students total. About 19,000 of our students are in our college programs and in college credit courses. We are a primarily a majority, a minority school. About 52% of our students are minorities and are on financial aid. And Guilford Tech has had three, uh, we're also a, a chief of Dream College, we were the first cohort in 2004. Guilford Tech has had three major initiatives under DEI, and all of these initiatives were built on the successes that we've learned through ATD. And we focused on improving our student success rates in our developmental education. At Guilford Tech, 70% of our incoming students Take, uh, have to take a developmental ed course. 40% of our new students place into two developmental education courses in two areas. So we know that accelerating them through dev ed is going to be most important for their success. One of the three things that we started was a program called SOAR. It's an orientation program. And it stands for Students, Orientation, Advising, and Registration. As part of our 2004 work in achieving the dream, we saw that that was one of our most successful ATV initiatives and was a major, it caused a major revision in the orientation process. During the years, we tracked the persistence of the students through SOAR, and over a three year period, we found that there were, they persisted to the next semester by 17%, and those, and those who did not attend. And at that time, we didn't require students to take an orientation. It was by choice. And we know students don't do option. And as they continued three semesters out, we saw that there was a 10% greater increase in those that were doing the silver well. So as a result of these successes, one of our DEI initiatives was to design and build on the SOAR orientation. We developed a specialized orientation for our students that are tested into the two developmental ed courses. And at that, they received a regular orientation. And in addition to that, they also received an orientation session with special trained advisors in our developmental ed group. We saw that there was a 6% gain in persistence for the students in specialized SOAR when compared to those that did not. Even more impressive, was a difference that they maintained over time that by the fall term, three years later, students attending specialized SOAR were twice as likely to be retained. And after the first year of DEI, we saw that persistence in the data that we made SOAR mandatory for all students and specialized SOAR mandatory for all new students placing in the two dev ed courses. So the next thing we looked at was advocacy. The second the initiative was for advocacy. What we tried to do was to assign somebody at the college to be a part and help our students. We trained over 283 faculty and staff who volunteered to serve as advocates. This initiative was interesting. In fact, over three years, we redesigned it each year. The reason was our students were not engaged, especially those that needed it. The second year, we had a student orientation class that we put our dev ed students in and required all of our dev ed students to take this course and to participate in the advocacy program. They had three writing assignments, so they would have to be engaged with their advocates. Well, again, results were disappointing. Students were not engaged with their advocates. This past year, we decided to look at students that were at risk. And we looked at students who were in dev ed and were on probation with their financial aid. Surely, they would want help in finding ways to work through the process and get the help that they needed. Well, guess what? They did. And again, we were disappointed in the engagement of our students. 
We continue to look at ways to find advocacy for our employees at the college to help our students in that process. A couple of things that did come out of the initiative, through all the training for those 283 faculty and staff, and we had everyone in the college involved, the president down to the cafeteria workers were helping our students. But it did promote awareness throughout the campus of the importance and the challenges of our dev ed. The third and most successful initiative that we've had at Guilford Tech, again, came out of what we were doing in our Achieve the Dream work. Through Achieve the Dream, we developed a face-to-face -face review session for our placement assessment. Early in the DE grant, the decision was made to offer these sessions both in an online format and in a face-to-face -face option. The initiative produced outstanding results for us at Guilford Tech and our students. Of those students that completed the review and retested, 59 to 74 percent of our students placed out of at least one English course. Between 63 and 67 percent placed out of one reading course. And between 38 and 47 percent placed out of at least one math course. Again, these were students that had taken the placement assessment and wanted to retake it. So we made it a requirement that if they re wanted to retake the placement assessment, they had to go through this review session. So a large number of our students were able to place out of or place up in dev ed. Then we asked the question, well, what are they doing in their other courses? So in their subsequent courses, we saw that in the developmental ed courses that they took, they were actually doing slightly better than the students that had placed and taken the placement test and placed into that class. We also looked at the gateway courses that they were in. Again, they were doing slightly better than the students that placed into those classes. So as a result of this success, the college approved policy change to require all students seeking to retest or take a face-to-face -face online review prior to retesting. We've even considered reviewing the prior first testing to see if all of our students need to do some type of working on and doing some type of uh, planning or assessment of their taking the test. Obviously, this has helped our students minimize the number of dev ed courses taken, and the monetary impact has been significant. Tuition savings to our students that tested out of dev ed during the first two years was over $350,000 in tuition savings to the students. Also, of course, it took the time that they were not using their Pell Grant money to be involved in developmental education. We've started this as a pilot project as well to go in and do the review of our placement test with some of our high schools. We're getting similar results. We hope to continue this and then even scale it up to the feeder high schools in our area. We all agree that both DE and their DEI and ATD group all agree that this has been our greatest success at Guilford Tech. One other footnote, I just recently came to Guilford Tech and after two years of going through the process, so as I, was, I came in in the fall of the second year. So the work that has been done at Guilford Tech goes to the prior, all the work goes to the credit of the prior president, Don Cameron, and all the faculty and staff that made the commitment. I've come in to be a cheerleader and support what they're doing and to continue the legacy that Guilford Tech has had in student success since their beginning in 2004 with ATD. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So what I think is most interesting um, about this is that we've got three very different institutions, right, serving, um, you know, in really different um, geographic areas and all of that, um, different sizes and all of those things. But those themes that run through that are important no matter what kind of institution you're working in, um, there's a lot about how important it is that things are faculty-led and, um, and what a difference that makes in um, being able to make some of these changes. Paying attention and, and not being afraid of 
the, the data, right? And um, having a way and a process on your campus where you can talk about those things in a, um, in a courageous way and in a safe way that leads to um, program improvements uh, across the board. So my first question um, to you all, and we'll, whoever can pick this up who wants to, um, since we're talking about scaling, right, this is a, that's what we promised everyone. Um, so you've given us an idea of sort of what the initiative looked like on your, on your campus. Um, what would you say, uh, your role as um, president, how did you use that position to um, make the way for scaling these things up? What, was, um, what were some of the um, steps that you took to make that possible? Really, in terms of scaling, it, it starts at the very beginning as we were doing our data analysis, looking at various options. One variable that we uh, used right at the beginning was, and still is, will we be able to maintain this? Because I think all of us have uh, lived perhaps through our lives where a grant comes, wonderful program, grant goes away, the program goes away. And it was our intention from the beginning that which we developed, that we would uh, be able to sustain it. So these accelerated courses, uh, we knew from the beginning that once we were through the pilot phase, that that would become part of the regular schedule. It wouldn't be set aside, uh, seen as something different. Uh, we do work, and uh, one of the initiatives we also included was a mentoring program by faculty and staff and we rejected multiple models, not because they weren't wonderful models, but because we wouldn't have been able to sustain them without external, chronic, and outside funding. So I think that's one thing. If you look at what is the cost, how you, will you maintain it, and that becomes one of the initial criteria. And I think another major variable to help with scaling is you never want this project to be seen as something outside of the norm of the campus. It was part of the routine. I have the advantage on my campus that we have monthly community meetings. They're one hour, they're very focused. As part of those meetings, we not only discussed what the data was showing, how it was changing, but we linked that which what we were determining in developmental ed to all areas of the campus. So the fact that a member that might be at the meeting is teaching history or anthropology or sociology or biology, the link was made, these are your future students. And so therefore, that which we're doing right now, concentrating on developmental education, the reason for that, these will be your students in the classroom. And it doesn't take much to link that to enrollment, to link that to budget, to link that to the financial viability of the college. So this wasn't just a developmental ed problem that we were trying to find solutions for and make it as part of the college uh, environment. It was affecting every area of the college and making that implicitly clear as we share data on persistence, uh, et cetera. I don't mean for this to be like a once upon a time story, but how it started in our college was before achieving the dream in DEI, we, um, there were, we didn't have a whole, I, don't, I was a new president, and I didn't feel there was a whole lot of interest in how developmental students were doing. And Ella was our developmental education teacher, and the students loved her, and we all loved her. And I started asking Ella, Ella, are you keeping any results on how students are doing? And she was. And she was very disappointed in the results. And um, the point is that she didn't have to share them with anybody because she was in charge and she, was, she wanted to improve them. But I was impressed that she had the information on success rates of students. Then what we started doing when we got into Achieving the Dream is we had, gate, we called them gatekeeper courses. And I think I take credit for changing that word to gateway because I said, why do we call them gatekeeper courses? We should be gateway because we don't want to keep people anyway. But anyway, so we started calling them gateway courses. We found out that our developmental courses, those are courses that 
most, the, a lot of students take and a lot of students fail, or don't get a C or above. And that would make a list. Well, people in our campus trust our IR person. Everybody trusts Patty, okay, we're <laughs> small enough. And so Patty started cr crunching out this data and she'd share it. It wasn't by name of instructor, it was by course. And that had a huge effect on our institution because our faculty want students to do better. They want them to do better. So the developmental faculty were frustrated and I will underline frustrated. My background was that I was an English teacher and I learned competency-based individualized instruction before computers. Do you know what I'm talking about? Packets, pre-test, <laughs> post-test, I was into it. You know, I love that way to teach, hi. And so I was, I was predisposed when I heard about Carol Twig and peers in my math lab, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is competency-based education with a computer. It's what I, I discovered, you know, 50, how many years ago? No, not that long, sorry. But anyway, so I got, I, I really like this, and our math department didn't know what to do. So I will, I will say I did it. It was an authoritative decision. Everybody was hemming and hawing. I said, let's try it. And it came from the president down. And the faculty, they didn't really know what, to, what it was, but they thought, well, it can't hurt. I mean, the president's not a bad person. You know, she probably doesn't know what she's talking about, but it can't hurt. Nothing else is working. So that's how we got started in math, okay? And we're making progress in, in using that system. The teachers, Chris is here. She keeps me honest. She's in charge of, would you raise your hand, Chris? She's in charge of developmental math and English. But she came on the line just as the math teachers were beginning to get it. They kind of said, okay, well, we, this individualized way might work, the math emporium that you're uh, talking about too, I think. So the English people, this woman over here was smart. She used a strategy that I should have used. She teased them with the idea, and I'll be, those English teachers got together and they begged for it. They said, we want to do it. And, there is a difference. The, the culture on our campus, the English department, we're, Pearson is choosing some of our, has chosen us as a model for some presentations. She has the English department, they're rocking. And it's not because of Chris doing it, it's just that she did it the right way. She engaged the faculty first. I didn't, I just said, darn it, let's do it this way. And Ella said, yeah, let's do it this way. But I have to say that the best way to do this is to really make sure that it's, it's faculty-led, faculty-initiated. And how you get them to do that is you show them the problem with the data. When they see how pathetic it is, when they look at this, they're gonna say, we need to do better. It's not because they're trying to save my job, trust me. It's that they wanna do better. They want our graduation rate to be higher because they care. Well, I see, uh, in coming into Guilford Tech just recently and uh, looking at our progression, and how we move forward with our scale up. It has really been a true progression for Guilford Tech. We started ADT, uh, eight, uh, achieved the dream in 2004, and through that developed the college, developed the culture of inquiry and using data to make the decisions. And one of the things I was so impressed when I came back in the fall of 2011 was that when I started asking about how do we do this, said, well, where's the data, President Parker? How we, we don't make decisions around here with data. So it was real, uh, I was really impressed with that. Uh, the institution that I came from to Guilford Tech was a, a rural college in northeastern North Carolina. And uh, we were, I wanted to move to that area and trying to build that, uh, that culture of inquiry is a difficult thing to do in your institutions when they're not used to looking at data. Uh, I, one of the first things I did at the institution that I was at before was I wanted to see what, how the production of all of our faculty, so I took one of our regular reports and had it ran and passed it out and, you know, they were saying, well, what are we doing? Our jobs are in jeopardy now. We started looking at all that data. But through that data inquiry that Hill for Tech had developed and moving through that process, getting the DEI grant was just a natural progression for our, our school. Uh, and the second year of the grant, uh, we went to the math emporium and all of our de developmental ed courses had moved to that in that area of progression. Uh, the state came in and was looking at what we were doing and now that's moving forward at the state level. We're also getting uh, colleges and universities in, in around North Carolina to come and see how that's working as well. And then back in uh, the spring of 2011, Guilford Tech was awarded the completion by design grant with uh, 
through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We're one of uh, three colleges now in the country leading the completion by design efforts. And one of, we have five partnering colleges in North Carolina helping with that. So in looking at scaling up, all of these things have been leading one step to the next. And so now as part of that, in my role in leading completion by design for the state, we've actually expanded that into our President's Association. And each quarter, uh, we come in and we give a report on completion by design. And back in, the, in July, we had 22 presidents from North Carolina to be a part of our meeting and talking about in our cadre what we're doing. And now we have a committee of our presidents association that is an ad hoc committee working on completion by design. And just recently, uh, we have added four more colleges, uh, which are Achieve the Dream colleges, to our completion by design efforts. So laying out that timetable just shows you the success that Guilford Tech and the faculty and staff have been dedicated to at Guilford and trying to scale this up in terms of how important it is to scale up our efforts uh, in our developmental education initiative as well as working to think about completion and student success. And also currently now going on in North Carolina, there is a committee looking at redesigning our math and English at the state level so that in North Carolina we will have a redesigned uh, both math and English in our developmental education. Oh, yeah, please. Yes. Just to get a feel for the audience, uh, how many of you at some point in your career have ever been at an institution where when a problem was found, whatever the problem was, that as long as it could be determined who to blame that took care of the issue? Have any of you ever experienced that? Okay. How many at uh, any point in your career, because I'm just listening, it's been a while since I've had a chance to talk to both of them, where the report comes out, it shows enrollment by every course acronym, ARC 101, ARC 102, English 101, you know, biology, physics, shows the enrollment and it shows how many students pass and how many students withdraw, how many students fail, that that just is seen as a data element that needs to be addressed at the department level rather than a gotcha report. How many of your institutions would that be just seen as a data element that needs to be looked at? Is that becoming more typical? Because I think that's one thing that we're trying to convey is that get moving away from any perception of gotcha to this are elements that together as a campus one looks at. And I've been in uh, all those situations where as long as you knew who to blame, you didn't have to do anything, you know, which is just a, a horrendous situation, versus now the comfort we all are trying to convey with uh, using data to try and determine where are the points of improvement that still need to be made versus someone's at fault. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I think another common thread here is also um, patience, right? That these are, um, this is not something that happens um, in a year or two years or even five years, right? The, the process of um, identifying what works, um, figuring out what's the right thing, what's your target group of, of students who, what will it mean, what will scale be? Is it just your developmental ed students? Is it the developmental ed students that test into two or three levels that you want in that specialized SOAR, or is it, is it everybody? You know, and, and there are steps along that, that path, right? So um, there's also got to be some serious um, stick to itiveness, right? As they say, um, to really um, get where you're going. That scaling is really kind of this continuous improvement cycle. So I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit about how you um, maintain the focus and commitment um, over the long haul to really see some of these improvements. Part of this, you put your money where your mouth is. I, I asked Aunt Abby, I said, are, are we, is the funding gone for DEI? I don't even know. I mean, I should know that. But no, I mean, it's gone. We, we're, we have continued every single, I don't want to call it initiative, because I think that makes it sound like a flash in the pan. 
We are, we are more solidly working on developmental ed now than we've ever done in the past. And, you know, we did get some grant money to help, but the sustainability of this is it's good for our institution. And as you can see, our board is very committed to student success. I, I want to tell you a quick story about Ohio. Um, the American Association of Community Colleges, sponsored through uh, DEI, had a board training. And I have been a president for 14 years in Ohio, and so I know there are some colleges that were among the five that started the initiative, Achieving the Dream in 2005. We were always very focused on student success, and, and other colleges have their own unique focuses. You know, some are in energy, uh, using wood chips to make sure that uh, they save money and electricity. You know, you, you kind of know the, the strengths of each college. But when you saw the, the, the board sitting at tables, there'd be a board for a college here, a board for a college here, and they were looking at the data. Some of them have never seen it before. You know, our board had seen it for years. There was a change. And that, I remember that day, there was a change in Ohio. When board members started looking at student success factors and seeing the graduation rates, how students in developmental courses did in the in their college level English and college level math, there was a change in Ohio. And I just, I, I think that we're not gonna go back. I, I know that in Ohio, board members, are, our board is saying, we need to spend more of our money on, on making these significant changes to get, this, to, to get the needle moving up. What do you need to make that work? So it, it really isn't about a grant. And um, someone today kind of corrected me. I said, you know, one of the things that really has cost us more money in education is technology. You know, the math emporium is expensive. You have to have computers for all your students. But it's well worth it because we're seeing that we're committed to it. But this person said it isn't just about technology because you can individualize in a classroom by doing cooperative learning, which isn't that expensive. You can use the idea we heard this morning about the one minute, you know, the Patricia Cross ideas of getting um, uh, feedback. The clickers aren't very expensive. They're, that's just an excuse that it's expensive. It's the right thing to do. And so with the, whether we have money from the Gates Foundation or not, we didn't even blink. I, I really did not know when the money ended. <laughs> not to say that right. we were appreciative. Right. I mean, we're right. help. Right. Well, I would agree with that, which Laura just stated. But I think for that long-term sustainability, people like being associated with winners. And you know, all of our data is a 10-year trend analysis so that you can look at that, see what is occurring you know, in retention, persistence, graduation, course success rates. Uh, sometimes there'll be a blip downward, but when you're seeing it on a 10-year pat pattern, you don't panic if there's a dip downward. You look to see, is it going to come right back up? And people like having the recognition of that their work is making a difference. We have an honor celebration at the end of every academic year where each department selects students to receive the psychology award, the biology award, etc. And what is absolutely fascinating is the number of students who are the recipients of these departmental awards and other awards that we give out, how many of them began with developmental education. So it shows the progress of the students and it again has the college associated with having students succeed and really being in that winning mode. So there is a lot of self-satisfaction and self board with it. Great. Just to follow up one thing I think that's gonna help us with sustainability and that is legislative action and mandates uh, mm. that we're seeing both mm. on uh, some of our mm. states uh, are, have, are not being funded in the future for DevEd. Uh, Ohio is going to, the majority of their funding have 50% being uh, completion based. Uh, in North Carolina, we're submitting a uh, new performance-based funding model to the legislature here in the next few weeks, which was just approved by our state board. So I think that part from the accountability that we're looking at, the legislative mm -hmm. mandates that we're giving in the uh, directions from our boards and commissions, I think that's really going to let these, this, these types of programs, uh, we're going to have to be sustainable because we mandate it. And we'll have to scale up because of those same reasons. All right. Thank you. Um, I think that um, 
you can see too how how those things work together, right? That that's been an important part of DEI and of this potential for scale up has been the um, that there is a college strand of the work and there's also a policy strand of the work and those things have to inform one another. Um, the policy makers um, have to know what's happening at the colleges they looked and in, in the DEI states and colleges they look to these colleges for those innovations and how is this working on your campus and then um, ideally you know um, then that informs the kind of legislation um, that that shows up on your doorstep. That isn't always the case as Connecticut is an example, right? But, but I think um, also that idea that um, focusing on these, on these issues um, at the campus level then helps you respond to whatever that policy environment is. So, um, and that can change. You know, you may have to head to scale a lot more quickly than you expected, but you've kind of at least um, done some of the, the background work to to get started on the right foot. So um, we'd like to um, let you have a chance to ask some questions here of um, our presidents. Um, we have a, a mic here, and I'm wondering if I can ask my colleague, Allison, to be the runner, if you'll uh, give us a hand. Um, if anybody has questions that you'd like to ask. Good afternoon. Earlier today, a colleague of mine and I presented on engaging resistance with regard to new initiatives. Can you speak, either one of you panelists, um, speak to how you engaged resistance? I would assume maybe there was some resistance maybe to some of the uh, initiatives, um, or we may be alone in that regard, but um, just wanted to get your comments. My experience in, in uh, leading a college over the years, not just in what was going on, getting protected the DEI, uh, but engaging resistance. Uh, what I've always tried to do is find a champion within the organization or champions, because if we, uh, or as leaders of administration of the college, are trying to push something down, you run into the pushback. And to try to identify people or individuals, sometimes you might have to hire the champion. If the, if the champion can't can't find the champion at your institution. But I think it's important. Um, I learned a long time ago, peer pressure is one of the greatest motivators. Uh, and so if you get someone that can, is buying into whatever the administration is trying to do or you as president is trying to do, uh, I call it the water cooler conversations or the faculty lounge conversations, that's where change takes place in getting people to buy in at that level. And I think that's important. To think, but that would be one one strategy I think you could use to engage resistance. And I think every one of us, we had for the solutions implemented, the majority were determined, led, implemented by the faculty and staff. So at least I know at my college, they developed that which was going to be done and tested. And so therefore, there was not that resistance. The resistance came from some faculty outside of developmental ed initially, which was the classic, why are we bothering? They shouldn't be here, just give me a better class of students. You know, that type statement. And that's where it became critical to show the pathway of the student who may begin in developmental, that is your future student, so that the bridge was created for them. I, I look at that two ways. One, uh, I'm an old debate coach, so it, when you have resistance, you show people there's a need, you have to prove there's a need to change, and then you show them a plan, and you have to be persuasive. You have to use facts and be persuasive. Or you can use comparative advantage. You might say there's really no need to change, but we'll have a better future if we do it this way. But both of those examples take, you have to use reasoning skills, and you have to use facts, and that's where the data comes in. But I think that people have used that on me. As a leader, I, I, when, you know, when I first was a president and we were getting into this, I didn't want to lose enrollment because we were a small college and we needed FTE. 
And when, when we start going to Achieving the Dream meetings, people will come back and say, we need to have mandatory orientation. We need to have mandatory soar. We, and I'm going, oh no, no. See, I'm a child of the 60s. You know, we're free. You know, just let, <laughs> free Willie. You know, just free us. Free us of regulations. Well, they worked it on me. And so what I, I think you have to do it both ways. If you're a president, you have to be willing to be persuaded. And I was persuaded. <laughs> I was, and you know, I'm not, so the data's not real clear yet, whether in our college, I know that Ceci says that mandatory orientation helps, but we haven't found the, the, the evidence that they did at Gil, for Guilford, so I'm still waiting, you know, it's okay to disagree though, right? And I didn't, you know, I'm, I'm still kind of going like this, you know, and they're doing the same thing with our, with our math and poriums. I think it's fine to have tension, but you don't want bullies. Bullies have to be handled. Because bullies are going to hurt an institution. And you hurt a bully, how I kind of do it is just by saying, well, we're going to try it. And we'll see how, you know, well, let us try it for three years. And if it doesn't work, I was wrong. Other questions? Oh. Okay. Well, I'll answer that question kind of in a fun way. I, I voluntarily had my salary frozen for f four years, too. <laughs> but nobody else was frozen. You know, I do some things sometimes um, because I think it's the right thing to do for me. No, I, I have no intention of, of changing our performance appraisal for, for faculty based on, on this form because we have a faculty appraisal that works pretty well. But there is one thing that I want to champion as president, and my swan song is, that we absolutely are losing productivity in faculty with office hours. All we, you know, you teach and you have office hours. And I think we need to measure office hours. That measurement needs to be made. Are you advising students? Are you coaching? What, how can we better use office hours? Because we, we have, at our campus, we have no idea how, how office hours are productive. So that's just one factor that I would see as a possibility. Not so much in the formal evaluation, uh, because the one thing I, I worry about and I'm very cautious about, in every presentation on how we need to have more graduates, we need to have more students passing courses, I am the one saying, but standards cannot be lowered. Because my uh, worry is, we can, we can easily take care of these uh, percentages of students succeeding by, by giving false grades. And so that's one area that I'm, I'm constantly reinforcing. Every faculty member shall do everything he or she can <clears throat> to help a student succeed, except the objectives of the course must be met, the standards must be there. Because I don't want to see that great inflation or the great integrity go away. What I'm finding, uh, not so much as part of formal evaluation, but peer pressure, I have not already heard in years on my campus, well, it's their problem, the students, if they came in stronger, or get me better students, and then I'll have better classes. I, as you asked the question, I realized that I haven't heard that in, in, in a number of years, and that used to be a pretty typical statement in response to, well, what's going on with the classes and pass rates. Great question, I love that. Hello, I had, oh, oh, it's okay. Did you have a quick follow-up? Sure. When I first came to my campus, I've been there 10 years now, uh, part of the interview
process was to give a, a cold question uh, to a teaching faculty member, uh, do stand up and do a five minute presentation on. And now that is the most absurd thing because what do we expect good quality faculty to do to prepare? And so therefore the teaching demonstration is not only given ahead of time, the time limit is given, but there's a, the scenario in terms of the diversity of the group that might be present. And successful candidates are those that use multiple teaching strategies, learning strategies, the interactive cooperative. Uh, faculty uh, uh, candidates who don't demonstrate that, they never pay, make it past the interview committee, they aren't recommended to me. Staff members, uh, and I'm thinking primarily in the student services area, but just about every area, what have you done to help students on your campus? That question in some way, shape, or form is a normative interview question at this point. So again, that's a beautiful question because we've made these changes without consciously saying we're now going to change this because. Thank you. I would say we've done the same thing in terms of the type of questions we ask. We're looking more for relationship skills and also st um, intentional strategies that teachers have to individualize. I think that's a great question. Okay, I had a um, question um, for the gentleman about your efforts to improve um, placement. And I'm just wondering, the struggle that we've had is getting students to attend any kind of review session because in order for them to, you know, to hike up their scores, it takes a significant amount of time in reviewing. And so I wanted you to just paint a picture of how you all are doing that. How much time it takes, is it a one day workshop, is it a week, that kind of thing. Well, I'm gonna ask our expert, <laughs> Ed, could you respond to that please? The, on the placement about the, um, how long we're doing our placement in the online section. I don't have that detail. I'm still a newbie. <laughs> uh, well, I think the first key to understand is that um, the way that we attain scale with uh, the Compass Review is that we made policy. So there was a policy that was put in place that said that if you want to retest, then you have to go through the intervention. So we have two kind of varieties of the intervention depending on the learning styles of students. They may either go to a face-to-face -face session, which would be taught by a developmental ed instructor and usually about a two-hour session where they would go over key points uh, to help the student. But in the spring of 2010, we developed an online compass review that we created in-house that has a pre-test, it has a post-test, it's got video instruction for each of our three developmental ed subjects. It's got links to other review materials that the student may want to go out and, and look at, Khan Academy, Purple Mass, some of these. Um, so this, you know, it depends on which of the subjects, for instance, on our math uh, compass review, we have 115 minutes of video instruction. Uh, the video instruction was shot in-house at GTCC with a math instructor, high definition video. Um, it's a very clean, easy to navigate uh, uh, system that we've created. So there's 115 minutes of uh, video instruction in math, about 30 minutes to 40 minutes for both reading and English. Um, and again, there are practice questions along the way. It's kind of laid out. The most important things to remember about uh, polynomials is this. Uh, so there's a number of things that we do. And, and so students, uh, particularly on the math, because we have something like 32 different sections across those 115 minutes, student may not spend very much time on the uh, fractions. They may spend more time on a, a particular area that their pretest showed that they needed work on. So it really varies, but it could be, the review could be done as quickly on reading and English. It could be done as quickly as a half hour to 45 minutes. The math could take up to two or three hours if they went through each one of the modules. Does that answer? 
I would like to follow up on George's question. He was talking about interview processes. As I shared earlier, I am a new president of Guilford Tech. This said work had been going on since 2004, uh, once Guilford Tech had started to achieve the dream. So I'll tell you about my interview with the board. Uh, they, I've had a lot of questions about achieve the dream. Uh, I had a lot of questions about the EI. I had a lot of questions about also completion by design because when I came and set, it, it was in the fall, spring, excuse me, in the spring, early summer for my interview, uh, that all of that was in the throes. And so uh, they shared with me what their priorities were and their interests were. And I had to convince them that I had the same, would have the same interests that they had. Uh, so uh, they would consider me for the position. I have carried that same process through in the folks that I'm hiring. They're senior, we've just recently hired two new vice presidents, one in academics and one in student services. So I spent a couple of hours each when they came to my office drilling them as well to make sure that they knew how important uh, these uh, efforts were for me and for our board as well. So I think we're seeing that all of these things kind of filter down into uh, our new employees that we hire and bring on, because if we are going to change the culture of our institution, you do it with new people you bring in. Uh, and so I think it's really important that, that that be a part of all of our process as we look at scaling and as we look at uh, how we change our institution to these new ideas and new methodologies. I think that's another great example, too, of how um, you know, one of the four principles of achieving the dream um, sort of, uh, process for institutional change is committed leadership. And I think that, that those hiring processes are a really good example of how important it is that leaders across the institution and up and down the institution understand what those priorities are and how what that looks like in a vice president position, in a faculty position, and um, that if you want to achieve that culture change and, that you, and you want to be able to scale those things up, you really have to have that kind of understanding um, throughout the institution. Um, and that, again, that is something that takes time um, and engagement across um, so many different um, you know, uh, faculty groups and student groups and, and in your leadership. So I think we have good examples of committed leaders who have done that, um, done that work at their institutions. Um, are there any other questions here before we wrap? I know you'll be sad if we end early, <laughs> but um, I want to say a, a special thank you to our panel today and to you um, for joining us this afternoon. Um, again, um, if you want to check out um, reflections from these three presidents and the other DEI college presidents, you can um, download this publication from MDC's website. You'll find it under our um, education projects. Um, and again, thanks a lot for um, joining us today.